Hey everyone, this is Chris, and you're listening to One Cross Radio. And today we are joined by uh, the always awesome author, pastor, and fantastic dude, Hector Mirai. Hector, how are you doing today? Doing good, man. Thanks for having me, man. No problem. Thank you for coming back. It's always exciting to have you on. Uh, you've had a crazy busy, uh, crazy busy year, but especially summer over the past uh, number of months, sir. Yeah, it's. Uh... I literally went into um, ending 2018 thinking 2019 is going to be my chill year. <laughs> and um, I was at uh, this uh, John Foreman concert, you know, the front man of Switchfoot. And uh, for his birthday, he did this project called 25 and 24. Okay. Where, where uh, it was his goal to put on 25 concerts in 24 hours. Oh, my goodness. And so he made a movie documenting the process. Um, but he performed 25 different concerts in 24 hours, each in a different location with a different crowd, with a different band, oh never repeating a song. So, like, he paid all original <laughs> stuff. And, um, like, you know, that's cool and all. That's, yeah, great details. But the the heart of why I'm telling you that is, like, one of the things that he said in that was like about what are you pursuing? What are your goals? What's worth really striving for? And like, I came out of that, like thinking, okay, um, my 25 and 24 is going to be, I'm going to rest. Like I'm going to spend time with my family and prioritize that. And I'm going to do less cons and I'm going to travel less. And that's like, I ended 2018 thinking super chill year. And then, um, (laughs) and then, 2019 has turned out by and large to be the most jam-packed, crazy, over-the-top opportunity year of my life. So, cheers to whatever I think is definitely not happening. So. <laughs> um, yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's... Wow. Um, one, I'm surprised that John Foreman did that. Just I can't wrap my mind around it, but uh, the movie, dude, is fantastic. It, like it, it left me in tears. Oh. Um, toward like just the summation at the end of it, it's it's gorgeous. I'll definitely uh, that's that's added to my watch list. Um, lately, my watch list has been like I've been needing light and fluffy, <laughs> so it's been revis- I- revisiting the office or. Uh, Watching the toys that made us. I can't wait for season three. Um, just like light and fluffy stuff, but that sounds interesting. Light and fluffy stuff is usually uh, my post writing season. Like whenever I've finished a book, um, I'll binge watch stuff. Um, like I think not this year, but last year, I watched uh, all of The Office, all of Parks and Rec all of the it crowd in one summer oh and 30 goodness. rock and 30 rock. So like I watched all of my favorite comedies, which so, you know, also subsequently are outside of the it crowd, NBC comedies. So I'm like, okay, NBC, I see you. <laughs> um, but no, it's yeah. I, I have my decompression season where I need to straight up just have my light and fluffy or if it doesn't even have to be light and fluffy. Sometimes it can just be like, mindless like actiony things but just something to decompress every every once in a while you need uh an expendables 2 just to enjoy the ridiculousness or a fast and the furious yes yeah (laughs) for me for me i like i'm a little more on the um if you've ever seen justified no i haven't um um justified is a magnificent piece of entertainment um and uh, Jeff, I want to, it's a, uh, oh man, the guy who wrote it, the Raylan Gibbons short stories that it's based on, Fire in the Hole, um, also is the dude who wrote like Get Shorty and a million other classic comedies. Right on. Um, so, uh, but fire, like uh, Justified is Raylan Gibbons, it's Timothy Oliphant playing like a low key cowboy with, um, what's his name? It, his last name's Coggins. He's like a he was the bad guy in the last Tomb Raider movie. Um, you've seen him in a million other things, um, but uh, he's just, it's just it's justifies one of those absolute entertainment actiony 
cowboy cop things. That's great. Nice. Um, I'll have to. I'll, I'll add that to my uh, to my watch list. I, I promise that one is not remotely disappointing. You, you'll come <laughs> out. You'll come out a better person on the other side. And there's 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 several spiritual themes like running steadily through it as well because like uh, you've got this guy who is a uh, the bad guy of the show is just as much the protagonist as the hero. Um, he starts out as a neo-Nazi terrorist. Wow. And, and then really quickly uh, goes to prison and meets Jesus. <laughs> and um, literally completely turns around, has like a full repentance arc. Um, and then his drug dealer gangster father murders his whole Hong Kong congregation. Uh, it's not a big one, but it's a lot. Yeah. Um, and then, so he's like, fine, you want to be dirty, I'll be dirty. And it's, so it's like the whole up and uh, yeah. down Prince Vegeta situation. <laughs> uh, uh, but it, it ends really well. But anyway, you have other things to talk about. Let's go ahead. <laughs> hey, I, I love the side tangents. Uh, before we dive in, I will say after reading the, I didn't get a chance to see Shazam in theaters. After reading okay. the chapter in your book, I'm like, all right, I was I wanted to see this. So then reading the chapter, I was like, Hector's been really excited about it. And other I've heard good things. So I finally sat down and watched it. Friggin' loved it, man. I'm like, I got to see the next one in theaters. They also filmed it around um, where I live. Uh, where yeah, I, used to live I remember in, that. Where I used to live in Toronto. But uh, the scene where um, they buy the beer... Like from the convenience yeah. store, legitimately a block away from my house. <laughs> I got off the bus to buy some cheese the night they were filming that scene. I had no idea what they were filming. I was like, man, once I saw the trailer, I was like, I should have figured out how to be an extra. I get on at that bus stop. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, all right. So yeah, I, I do have some questions. We'll, uh, we, can, we can dive in. Uh, you've explained a lot, but you had uh, on your episode and various others, but you had the opportunity this year to go to San Diego Comic-Con, which mm-hmm. is like the known Comic-Con. And, but I think you've even said it. at this point, it's more of a pop culture expo than it is necessarily like a comic convention. Right. But that was still a huge opportunity when I saw... You sharing that on Instagram, I was so excited for you, and I was praying for you, man. Um, how? Thank you. No problem. Uh, how did that happen, and what was your experience like? So, in a nutshell, uh, there is a group of uh, like-minded individuals on the other coast from me. Uh, the guys uh, with Geeky Guys for God and Geeky Gals for God out in California. Um, I think they have a branch in San Diego and a branch in, like, uh, I don't know, another spot in San Diego. Um, OC, they, the OC branch. Um, but by and large, they're like a fellowship service small group ministry based around the concept of being Christians and geeks. And... um they have used my books before for small group studies. In fact, I think they're uh, doing some stuff now awesome. with that. And uh, through that, though, uh, one of the the dude who runs it, Joe Queen, um, has been working with San Diego for a while. Um, and they have good connections with the guy who is over the Christian Comic Art Society, which, honestly, I'd never heard of. Yeah. Um, but then again... There's a lot of things we don't know about, even in the cultures we travel in. And uh, so the Christian Comic Art Society has been having Sunday morning church services at San Diego for 27 years. Oh, that's awesome. Um, And so they also have panels and stuff like that. And they, the Christian Comic Art Society also is always the ones that instigate like uh, the spiritual themes and comics panels, stuff like that, where they have a very diversified group. And... um. Joe basically pitched me to the guy that's over the Christian Comic Art Society and said that I would be a good addition and uh, that it would be worth it to have me out there on the panels. And so they did it. They agreed to it. Uh, they put me on three panels. One was a mixer, like 
like hangout time for people in this industry, specifically Christians working in the geek industry. Nice. Like, so it would be like a panel you would be on and like stuff like that. Um, and they had me on that. They had me on the one that was spiritual themes and comics, which was a very diversified, uh, base of people discussing, you know, spiritual themes and comics, literally about every, pseudo spiritual background you can imagine was there um and it was a good conversation and then they had a sunday morning service where this year uh it had to be called a panel because of a snafu from the previous year um the where they have the church service is directly above hall h right and hall h is the building that has all the celebrities and the movie stars and all the things and apparently 2018 you could hear the worship music through the floor (laughs) in hall h so it had to uh this had to be a year where it was a little more Mm low-key and um but we still had a full sunday morning service and we shared themes and ideas and you know had a full time of doing that and it was a really great experience and um but yeah they brought me out there uh they got me on the panels got me out uh on the panels as a professional so that was nice because uh, I've been doing Comic Cons for at with Faith and Fandom for going on seven years, and I've had guest badges, and I've had Artist Alley badges, and I've had vendor badges, but I've never had the coveted professional badge. And um, then I finally got my professional badge, and it was at San Diego Comic Con, and it was at the fiftieth San Diego Comic Con. So uh, there was just a lot of greatness with that. Yeah, that. That's awesome, and that even though it's already passed, I'm still like so excited that you had the opportunity for that, man. Like, that's awesome. Oh, me too. <laughs> and then like uh, one of the people in the group, even uh, in their actual group, uh, paid for my ticket to fly me out there, and another group housed me. So like, wow. It yeah, it was it was insane to get that kind of opportunity, and you know, just be treated treated like it was a priority. You know, it's 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 my personal like humility body check of uh you went to san diego comic-con as a guest professional panelist but you can't get your books in your local library (laughs) (laughs) so you know a prophet gets no honor in their own hometown so it's like major cities near me have done like newspaper front pages and stuff on me and my local newspaper was at a book event i was at this past week and they said i think we've heard of you (laughs) and i was like i was like okay cool good talk Um, (laughs) oh man i'm like that's all right cool that's so good um so the uh the other question i had uh or actually i have a bunch but um this year, you've also start. You've been on a couple different podcasts because you're doing um, like a two or three minute one. Um, I just can't remember the name of it. Uh, it's a uh, called Critical Hit, and yeah. it's on a uh, back row radio. It's a uh, basically like you know, in or at least in our areas, like on K Love and stuff like that. Like Louis Palau or some biblical teacher pops up and like does like a two or three minute devotional, and then in between songs and um. They hit me up about doing that, and um, it's it's been fun. We've covered everything from Batman casting to uh, <laughs> I just turned one in for Gears of War Five. I mean, it's it's been kind of all over the place. That they just want geeky devotionals in a little three minute nugget, and so that's that's been fun to do. Nice, and and it's also a really good radio station. From I I personally struggle with radio. I'm very much the DJ in me uh, likes to control what I'm listening to. <laughs> and, like, I judge I judge really harshly, like, what comes on the radio or what other people play. And I'm like, no, 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 I need to pick it. But, like, I can actually listen to that and be okay with my life. So. I um, I ran a, uh, in, when I was in high school, we had a bulldog radio thing. And it was a student-led radio th- uh thing where you just couldn't play music with swearing or anything where it's like hardcore drug references and all that and ever since doing that i'm like i I don't like listening to the radio i might be like oh here's a snippet of a song i like 
and then it's just like, all right, now I'll just throw on the iPod. Let's just like go with our lists of stuff that we know. Not to the extent because you're a wedding DJ, um, <laughs> but uh, the uh, I- I'm still oh. of that mindset where I make mix CDs <laughs> just to <laughs> like have in the car. Like I've got a right now. I've got a hype CD and an emo CD in my car, <laughs> just depending on my mood. <laughs> I've got playlists like that made up on Spotify where it's like, all right, I need to get a good mood. I need to get hype. Or it's like, let's just recognize what this day is and time to throw on the the sad tunes. Yes. <laughs> uh, the other podcast you've started with uh, another friend and pastor, um, and I apologize if I'm saying, saying his name wrong, Chris Poirier. I'll say it wrong, too. It's okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I think I was right. I don't think I was right. <laughs> Uh, you guys started the Pull List podcast. Um, what led to that happening, and and how's that going? Um, well, Chris and I were meeting on a semi regular basis, um, just getting together because at, at that point in time when we started it, we were both living in North Carolina, just like an hour and a half apart, and um, so we would literally get together in like the parking lot of a playground <laughs> with a laptop and a microphone, and just sit in the truck. And like sit in his truck and record. Um, But we were doing that. And, you know, a lot of times it would end up just being comic book discussion. And when Love Thy Nerd, uh, which is a another like minded organization, um, when Love Thy Nerd launched, one of their things was they wanted a podcast network. So they had they had guys doing board game stuff Mm -hmm. and they had uh, guys doing video game stuff. And we basically fit the description to do the comic book stuff. And so we basically just took what happened organically between the two of us and put it in a format. And so now like a bi week or every other week we are doing podcast uh, descriptions and breakdowns about what's going on in comics and the overarching themes going on in comics. And uh, I think we've done, we just recorded 23. Maybe 23 is out. I don't remember. It but, is. Uh, I, we... I just listened to it today before okay. we started this. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so next, uh, I think our next one is uh, one year later, if not sooner. But uh, it's it's been good, and uh, it's a good time with that. And one of the crazy things is, like, you know, the credibility that gives with some people versus it not, like... Uh, you know, again, it's the whole prophet hometown thing. Like, <laughs> there's there's a pastor that, like, literally their church, I can see their church from my front yard. Um, and we serve and minister in the same community and all these things. And then all of a sudden he's like, you're on the Love Thy Nerd podcast? I'm like, <laughs> that was like, I was like, oh, now I'm okay? Cool. Uh, <laughs> it's like, you've not talked to me, but now, but now we're cool. Great. I appreciate that. Um, but it's, it's one of those things of, you know, people, I, it, it's an honor, I'd say, and a, you know, a good responsibility that people value what you have to say and trust you enough to give you a platform mm-hmm. and, um, to trust your stuff with that. Cause like, realistically, that's about 24, 25 hours of he and I just talking about comic books over the past year. And that that's a lot to listen to, but it's, it's been encouraging and it's been a good ride. Uh, it's also made me buy more comic books than I had before, which sucks. Um, <laughs> Cause I end up going broke or what he'll mention something. And like, I'm like, Oh, I missed that. And I'll be like literally in the middle of the podcast and start buying new ones. And, um, but it, it's been, it's been a good ride. Awesome, man. Awesome. Uh, this next question is kind of inspired by a conversation you guys had on the podcast a couple episodes ago. Uh, you guys discussed the new DC movie Batman Hush, uh, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and I I know your you, you it came across very clearly. Uh, you're you're not that big of a fan of it, um, which actually I had watched it not too long beforehand. I'm like this is very different from the comic, but it's in the continuity of the new 52 ish continuity they have with their movies, but. Right. I love having the conversation about what makes a good adaptation. So, I know you didn't think it was one, and that is 100% fair. What do you think makes a good adaptation, and what are some of your favorite 
of the DC movie adaptations. Well, and here's the thing. I think Hush could have been a good adaptation, and I think for a very large portion of it, it was. Mm. It just it derailed on some important areas. Um, and I think the overall thing when it comes to an adaptation, you have to be able to take the heart of a story, even if you don't transfer all the details, mm-hmm. the heart needs to come across. Because very much so, uh, Infinity War... No, wait, hold on. What are the Avengers movies called? Endgame and... and... Infinity War. <laughs> or, Infinity War. It is yeah. Infinity War. Okay. <laughs> uh, those aren't good adaptations. Fair. Um, they're good movies-ish. And... Um, you know they're they're okay. Hot take. <laughs> Hot, um, like I really enjoy the last hour of Endgame, and if I could buy a DVD of just the last hour of Endgame from that moment where Captain America, Thor, and Iron Man walk from the rubble towards Thanos, right. from that point on, I can watch that all day. Um, <laughs> but like whatever. Um, but those aren't good adaptations. Because they're the adaptation of a six-issue story right? that had a completely different feel to it. Mm-hmm. That Thanos wasn't this uh, deep-thinking, like, humanitarian, not humanitarian, but, like, philosopher or whatever, you know, trying to better the world. He was trying to impress a girl. Yeah. And acting very stupidly in the process. So, I meant, like, it's, it's, the movies are better than the story and than the comic. But that doesn't make it a good adaptation. That's fair. Um, and like Hush, like to me, the thing I, I just really liked that all of the book of Hush was such a chess match. It was such an intellectual, you know, cat and mouse game, and that it played on the deepest heart issues in Batman's story of Hush. You know, the the idea of his guilt over Jason Todd, his guilt over Barbara Gordon, um, that all of the stuff that they're dealing with. And you literally took out the biggest heart pieces of the story. Um, and like, literally if you can't translate the heart of the story, it's not a good adaptation. Like for me, um, and I may have mentioned it in that podcast too, but the thing like, I really feel like uh, Young Justice season three was a good adaptation of the um, the Judas contract, um, like the Tara betrayal yeah. story. Yeah. Um, Young Justice season three had the heart of that through the whole way through, and it did actually change story parts. But I felt like it was more faithful than that. Um, I feel like Under the Red Hood was good. Oh yeah. Um, but on the flip, you know, not that it was perfect, but it captured a lot of it. But that's the thing. And that was my beef with a little bit of Under the Red Hood and Hush together is that they're the same story. Right. Um, and when you and I feel like that's one of the limiting factors of the Under the Red Hood movie is that it's. It's anchored in Hush. And so when you don't have the Hush story to play off of. You know, you're missing some of the foundational things. And then on the flip side, the Under the Red Hood story is part of the heart of Hush. Uh, because it literally is the first place you see Jason Todd coming back. Mm-hmm. And all that. And so, it's just when you when you take out core hearts of it. Um, you know, it's the same deal with uh, Thor Ragnarok. Thor Ragnarok was not a Thor movie per se. Thor Ragnarok was Marvel's way of... Uh, shimmying around the legal rights that they're struggling with with Hulk and Universal. Yeah. Because Thor Ragnarok was playing at Hulk with a lot more comedy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it was their way of making a playing at Hulk movie um, and setting up... Literally, Thor Ragnarok was, hey, let's do playing at Hulk and then a setup for Endgame. That was it. That's fair. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, that's... I, again, so, like, if you've read the Thor Ragnarok books, like the old school ones, uh, there were definitely elements of it in there, but, at, again, it's, 
the heart was real different. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's the struggle. I think it needs to have a heart of it. But then you have movies like the DC animated versions of The Dark Knight Returns that are almost literal translations shot for shot. And um, I, I'll, I'll say this. I think what gives, what makes a good adaptation is when you can translate the heart of a comic but add layers that you couldn't fully grasp before. Right. I think that's um good. and you know right now like me and my kids are reading the My Hero Academia manga mm-hmm. and there was a uh, the last book had them putting on a like hype rock concert party thing for their school <laughs> as a project. Um that doesn't translate fully on paper. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, because you don't get the full vibe of it. And, like, so that, I want an adaptation of that for that purpose. Um, to be able to hear things, to feel things, experience things. I think it's a good at- adaptation if when it really translates that. The heart and the... St- and layers that you can't get before. And here's the difference, though. I, it's one thing if you use stories as source material, mm-hmm. and it's another if it's a translation yeah. or adaptation. Hush was an adaptation, but really it just used Hush as source material. Right. Um, if you look at like uh, Batman Begins and The Dark Knight, um, you can point out specific books that those came from, like Long Halloween and Batman Year One. Mm-hmm. And things like that. You can you can see source material present. Well, even in the Dark Knight Return, uh, Dark Knight Rises, you had No Man's Land. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you can see yeah. source material, but it's not a direct adaptation. And that's the thing: if you're going to make a direct adaptation, I think you really need to have the heart in place. Because mm-hmm. um, it's when you don't, I think it struggles the most. But I mean, that's that's the thing too, like. If you're making an adaptation of a really beloved book, I think you've got to do it justice. Like, I just... You can't not. Uh, But on the flip side, the Ninja Turtles versus Batman movie? Oh my gosh, yes! (laughs) Holy cow, that was great! That was awesome! Um, (laughs) uh, That's probably the best animated... Uh, Batman movie I've seen in a while and I might go as far as to say it's the best Ninja Turtle movie since like the original so <laughs> I, um, I, it's definitely up there uh, like I, the original Ninja Turtles movie to me that's the standard for the, the Turtles movies and yeah. an amazing adaptation because it also like it had the original comics it also had elements of the show it's a great coming together of those and then this captured everything so well i was like oh my goodness this is awesome like i literally i watched that with my kids and we i laughed my head off the whole time and they couldn't understand why i was so entertained and i'm like well it's like they're making classic turtle references they're making classic batman references and even in the uh end credits where they had the ninja turtle comic covers mashed up with the batman covers i'm like you are literally catering to your audience well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's just... It, it, it's a it's a hard sell when you're adapting things and, you know, not doing it... Well. Like, one instance, too, like... Uh, it's not the same bubble exactly, but uh, with Doctor Who, mm. um, it had been canceled for 18 years mm-hmm. or, like, somewhere in that bubble. Yeah, there was an 18-year cancellation. And... BBC wasn't doing anything with it, so they let America take a crack at it. <laughs> oh, the movie. Um, and now here's the deal. The movie, to me, was a good adaptation. Um, like, uh, Paul McGann was dope uh, mm-hmm. in doing his thing. Uh, the Master was great. Um, you know, The Master was probably... The mo- the movie master is probably one of my favorite masters. Um, <laughs> like I know they did the whole like confusing thing about half human, half yeah. doctor. 
But David Tennant plays that up later. Mm-hmm. Um, it kind of adds to the credibility of that. And then, you know, you bring Paul McGann back for the Day of the Doctor stuff later. And um, I felt like that was a good adaptation. Yeah. Like, you took the heart of something. Because at the end of the day, it was still the heart mm-hmm. of Doctor Who. Um, very well done. Um, where, like, uh, I feel like some adaptations and, like, the comparison of where if the Doctor Who movie is a good adaptation, Batman Hush, the movie was like Bill and Ted as an adaptation of Doctor Who. <laughs> um, because, I mean, realistically, Bill and Ted is a real rough concept. Not knockoff, but like a nod to Doctor Who. It's uh, people traveling through time in a phone booth. Come on. Yeah. I, mean, it's, I mean, it's like, okay, that's sort of Doctor Who, but... <laughs> I wouldn't exactly call it an adaptation. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, you, you know, those, um, if you go to like Dollar Tree or some generic store, they have the knockoff <laughs> action figures. Yes. Like, that look wonky and are terribly made and have like some vague resemblance and name. I feel like some adaptations come out looking like a generic toy. Yeah. Rather than a faithful adaptation. Yeah. Um, like that, but like some other or <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, and that's the other thing too is like, Pete. I think that it's a rough market to do adaptations because if you give people exactly what they're expecting, they're not going to be surprised, and they're not going to have. Because l- listen, if they had done a, a shot for shot adaptation of Hush, that would have you know not been quite entertaining to people that have read the book right because they they already know the twists and turns um so this was an interesting thing but it just gave the new people a much lesser story right um but like then you take things like uh the killing joke where it's an adaptation but you add 45 minutes of out of context unnecessary <laughs> ridiculousness <laughs> that made the following forty five minutes painful. Yeah. Like 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 I said, like with you give me the last hour of Avengers, give me the last forty five minutes of killing joke. Fine. Yeah. Um but that first forty five minutes, I'm like, what on earth just happened? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. It's just it's a hard thing when you take a story that's layered and deep and you strip away everything uh, that you think you don't need, but it's the stuff that, that gets stripped away is what you actually need. Right. And, I, you know, that's difficult. Yeah. Uh, before I move on, I will offer my own, uh, I guess, hot take, if you will. Uh, Amazing Spider-Man 2 is uh it's a bad film as much as i love loved garfield in the role uh i can't defend much of amazing spider-man 2 but the thing that hinged on it for me was capturing the heart of gwen's death and even though they changed up a lot of it i still felt they got the heart of it where well, he was straight up heartbroken, and I will watch Garfield cry all day because that dude can cry really, really well, um, <laughs> which is a weird thing to say. But like the moment where it was the web catching her, there was still enough room of doubt of if he was too late or if she, if it was the webbing that caused the sudden stop in the next snap. Right? If they had changed that, I would have been much more furious with the movie. Whereas with that, I was like, all right, that's the moment that hinged this flick for me, and uh, I'll roll with it. I'm satisfied. But a lot of people are just ready to throw out everything from Amazing Spider-Man 2 because the overall product is not good. Um, I actually never saw any of the Garfield Spider-Mans. Really? I was just like, I don't need another Spider-Man reboot right now. <laughs> that's, that's fair. That's fair. I, uh, like I, I only knew Garfield from Doctor Who, and <laughs> like that wasn't like a bad thing. It was just like meh. I, I, f- up until the up until Tom Holland, um, which I mean is just one actor removed. Uh, out of the first, f- the non Marvel Spider Man movies outside of Into the Spider Verse, 
The Amazing Spider-Man is my favorite. Uh, I recognize it's got flaws, but I didn't care for the first three at all. Um, and I lo- there was something about Garfield's capturing of the character I found I enjoyed much more than anything Tobey Maguire did. But the, the, the Spidey fans of the original three hate me, so that's fair. <laughs> well, I, I can't get down with, one, with three at all. Um, and three was just a hot buttered mess. Oh my goodness. Um, (laughs) uh, two, I feel like two was a really solid entry, but I also feel like it was, I, I felt like the whole thing with Kirsten Dunst and McGuire was just forced. Yeah. And, um, it was pretty, and I got to say it was a, a step in the right direction and the soundtrack was dope. Um, or maybe that was the first one, but, um, you know, some of the soundtrack stuff for the Spider-Man movies was great. But uh, I think my favorite thing uh, out of all of the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies was, like, I think the first line out of the first movie. Mm. Um, like, every good story, this one's about a girl. Like, that has registered with me, <laughs> like, so well. And, um, like, that replays my mind at, at the most weird times and everything else. Like, you know... Like, I I just, I like that line. That's fair. Um, And if I don't remember anything else or appreciate anything else about those movies, I appreciate that line. That's that's fair. The other thing I have to give the original trilogy is it gave us uh, J.K. Simmons' Jonah Jameson, which I'm like, I don't want anybody else playing that character. He's awesome. Like, just give... When he showed up at the end of Far From Home, I was like, all right, I'm in. That's the only thing you need to bring over. Like, that's it. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> oh, that's, he is great. And, like, you know, it also gave us a, a good amount of Bruce Campbell cameos. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, Macho Man Randy Savage's Bone Saw. Um, <laughs> and, you know, that was, that was one of the last things Macho Man did. Yeah. And, um, Before you know, his it was rap like, album. Did he do a rap album? Oh, you didn't know he did a rap album. It's awful, but it's also awesome. It's called Be a Man. He did a diss track to Hulk Hogan and a tribute song to Mr. Perfect. Oh my gosh. I have to find this. Ooh-wee. Ooh, yeah. I'm down. I'm going to have to find this. Oh, my I love goodness. Oh, man. I grew, up, I, I grew up watching Macho Man. I was, like, literally there when he bit his tongue off um, at a show once. Oh, wow. Oh, man. I, I can't. Oh, man. I, see, there's certain things where I'm like, I just assume everybody knows this stuff. This was one of them. Uh, yeah, no, he's got it, it. Yeah, the album's called "Be a Man," and the the title track is a diss track to Hulk Hogan, and it's it's wonderful. <laughs> huh. Um. All right. So the uh, the next question is: um, You've been a huge supporter of Tom King's Batman run. I think actually every time I've had you on the podcast, uh, at some point we've talked about Tom King's Batman run. But um, fair enough. <laughs> over the course of the pull list, uh, we've been <laughs> you've shared your thoughts, and it has some high high points and some slow and low points that you've been fairly critical of. Um, not fairly critical. I mean, you get what I mean. Um, where does this run currently stand for you? As it stands, when all is said and done. Um... It will still rank... Well, first of all, it's one of the longest Batman runs out there. Right. Um, I think Collective Works, it will be the longest Batman run I've read minus Grant Morrison's Batman run. Um, Which Grant Morrison's Batman run, in a lot of ways, was less Batman and more Batworld. Just because that included... um, Well, Grant Morrison's Batman run brought us Damien. And then it killed Batman, and then it had Dick Grayson as Batman, and then it had Batman traveling through time to try and get back home, and then it had Batman <laughs> Incorporated, um, and it gave us people like Professor Pig, and um, you know I feel like uh, you know I feel like Grant Morrison's Batman run was dope, um, 
But to me, when all is said and done, I think this will probably still be at the top of my list for long reaching Batman stories. Like as that when you've got this much content, because realistically there are two arcs I didn't love out of everything he's done. Mm-hmm. I didn't enjoy nightmares. Well, I enjoyed nightmares, but I was impatient because I wanted to get on with it already. Um, and while I appreciate what was being done with the war of jokes and riddles, um, man, <laughs> I just didn't want it right then. Um, and I think, I think that's been the overarching theme is that, uh, what's happening is he's just giving stuff that I don't want right when he's giving it to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's, I think, but, uh, for me, it still holds some of the best Batman of all time. Um, I think it's done some things that are so important and so crucial. Uh, it's, it's developed the Batman Catwoman relationship better than anything we've ever seen. Um, dude, some of my favorite moments have just been the bat family stuff. Like I think like one of my favorite moments he's brought us, um, was Batman, Duke, Damien, Jason, and Dick and Bruce sitting down at a Batman themed fast food restaurant (laughs) and sharing a meal against bruce's wishes like bruce didn't want to be there and um they're talking about how good the joker seasoning is oh my god and then i think my favorite moment out of all that is that um in damien's happy meal toy he got a red hood action figure and he was angry um (laughs) um i mean it's like little moments like that because that's the thing like he appreciates he has some just deep love and appreciation for these characters and gives us stuff we haven't gotten before. Like, and I know I've mentioned it before, but like the, the integrity story arc of the internal eternal vow thing with him and wonder woman Mm -hmm. literally still wrecks me. Um, the super friends thing with him and Lois and Bruce and Clark going on double dates was wonderful. (laughs) Um, like, uh, I mean, there's just been some of the stuff in there, like the whole, I am Gotham arc at the beginning like the stuff with him, like what he said to literally the first issue, um, everybody gets scared. So everybody gets the chance to be brave. Um, like just telling a little boy that man, that was freaking awesome. Uh, where you've got stuff like, uh, like, like Batman 53, like the whole thing of quoting scripture and, Mm -hmm. um, like that whole arc. I meant like, when I look back at this, you know, warts and all, I I will stand by that this has been my favorite collective Batman run. And, um, you know, but he, that's the thing Tom has always done. Tom has always played the long game. Like, his stories are not short payoff Bam Pal stories. They are long and overreaching. And, you know, I think once you get to the end of it, you're going to see how beautiful that all plays out. So I know that they're doing the adjustment of where after city of Bane, someone else is taking over and the rest of his story is moving over to the Batman Catwoman book. Um, but it's the same stories that would have been his Batman arc. Right. Um, so not really hurt by that. Um, but yeah, it's like, I, I think, Tom King's run on Batman will be a long-term masterpiece. And, um, like for me, there aren't, there aren't that many complete runs because like I said, one of the things about Grant Morrison's run is if you put it all together, there's not another collection like that. Like I I have all of Grant Morrison's run in physical format and it's about like that. Like it's, if you stack all of Grant Morrison's run just in comics, it's about two feet tall. Um, and like, I literally carry a short box around, uh, to loan to people to say, if you want to read a good Batman story, start here. Right. Um, and you know, cause it goes to all of them. Honestly, like 
I think it's a good legacy run because there are, I mean, if you think about it, there aren't that many people that carry more than 24 issues at a time. Right. So when you're into the late fifties, early hundreds, you know, and with one art, like you, they did that with, you know, ultimate Spider-Man and they did that with some other things, those stories and like walking dead, when you can see, uh, artists and writers heart carried out consecutively, it, it just really adds value to it. Yeah. Thank you for thank you for sharing that, man. Um, and your opinion. I, I really love talking the comics with you, and you break it down so well. Um, when you mentioned the Grant Morrison run, I was like, one thing I'm very thankful for that is that set up uh, Tim Drake's Red Robin run, which I know Chris Yost wrote. And I was like, man, yeah. I miss I miss Tim Drake, and I loved that Red Robin run because I bought it on a whim where I'm like, I want more Tim, and this is available. And then when I read it, I was like, dang, this is really, really good. Um, so that that's my plug. Uh, listener, check out, if you can, <laughs> the Chris Jost, uh Red Robin run with Tim Drake. Tim doesn't get enough love. <laughs> he doesn't. And honestly, that was a sore spot for me in Hush. Mm. Um, because in Hush, in the book, there's this beautiful moment in the cave where Bruce has a, a side to himself where he says... Tim is the best of all of us, and one day he will be the next Batman. Right. Um, and to substitute that with just Damien making a douchey like, phone call, I'm like, man, this is lame. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If it's, it's one of those things where I'm like, man, I kind of wish they did. I, I like the intercontinuity some of the DC animated movies have, but... Yeah. With some of the like, with moments like that where you're like, okay, that makes sense with your new Fifty Two continuity and the Damien you've established, but that takes away a great moment from another character that I would have loved to see. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, man, Hush Two also had one of the best uh, Huntress arcs, and then you know she's just not even there. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the other que- uh, other couple questions I have are. What are some of your other uh, con highlights from this year? Uh, I'd say one of the other con highlights was uh, doing a geek church service at Galaxy Con Raleigh this year. Um, it was just a great service. Um, I met a lot of really cool people at that show that were super encouraging or that needed encouragement. Um, like uh, we had a, that a church service that Sunday morning and not knocking my church or anything, but we had more people at geek church than my church. And, um, so cause like, uh, I've got a, I've got a sidekick that kind of runs things when I'm not around at my church. And, you know, I sent him a photo of, uh, the crowd at geek church right before it got started. And he sent me one back. He's like, you've got more than we do. And I was like, Hey, um, not that numbers really are the thing, but you know, the fact that it's at this big comic con and, uh, getting to do this has been really good. Um, let's see. I got to, Oh, what else? I got to put, um, Bible studies in river songs, hands, not river song, uh, river Tam, uh, summer glow. Uh, I got to put the books in her hands and that was nice. Um, and she was really receptive to that. So that's, that was a con highlight. Um, let's see. Uh, I know we mentioned San Diego, but honestly, dude, the first time seeing my little name placard, um, on, but in front of the big curtain, like yeah. the, that, that's like sitting right over to my left right now. I've got my name placard, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've got to make a cool little display for that at some point. But, um, you know, it's, it's just little things like that, but it's, it's been a long, uh, a long road and a long year and I've had some people come up like just in tears over what the books have meant to them or I've had families come up and you know say that you know oh one one thing um there uh a lot of the stuff I write I write just for me like uh just because it ministers to my heart and um I remember there was somewhere around book two or three I think it's book two but um I was like I think I just lost my mom or dad. Oh, it was my dad at that point, but I'd lost both of my parents in a bubble, like a short bubble. And, um, like 
I'd lost my mom right before I started Faith and Fandom, and I'd lost my dad right after it had gotten started. And, you know, that kind of stuff really kickstarts your whole mental process of actually dealing with death and everything else. Yeah. And um, so I wrote a chapter just wrestling with my own struggles with death, like actually believing in eternal life or actually believing life. Had, like, I just wrote my struggles and my pain and everything else with that. And um, there's a chapter called uh, Nobody Stays Dead in Comics. And um, and it just really dealing with the concept of death. And, uh, you know, that's not the chapter that a mom wants to read her kid before bed or, you know, <laughs> that is going to end up, you know, as I don't think it's usually going to end up as people's favorites. But, um, like, uh, there was a gentleman at one of my shows this summer that uh, came up and he's, he's older than me. Um, but, uh, he came up to say that uh, his father had died recently, like within a week of me seeing him. And um, he said that he had read that chapter every day since his father had passed. And it's the only thing that had kept him going. Wow. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's stuff like that where uh, as, as uh, Andy Minio said on his recent album, those are my trophies when people in pain quote me. Um, the fact that uh, this stuff can be beneficial, it can be helpful, it can be encouraging. Um, you know, just that it, it's a seasonal thing because I spend, like, realistically, I spend October through March going to much less cons mm -hmm. and sitting up late at night writing. Um, so I'll spend six or seven months in isolation without feedback. Right. And then like summer months or con season is really like actually hearing how this stuff affects people or impacts people or, um, and so it's, it's been good. Uh, but that, I think that's always been my highlights has been that is just seeing, uh, just seeing how it affects people in a positive manner. And, um, you know, also like, uh, I gave the books away free on Kindle yeah. a couple weeks ago and, um, we had 2,700 downloads, which is so, awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, so 2,700 copies of books, uh, went out free for me into the world. And like, just seeing that, you know, going on seven years into this, there's still an interest in it. It's still, and it, not that's an still an interest with people that have already been involved, but it's still finding new audiences. And mm -hmm. and I get it. Like if you don't want to spend money on a book, you don't want to spend money on a book, which is why I do that. Because if it can be a resource to somebody, because there's some books you know I wouldn't pay for. <laughs> and then, you know, <laughs> if if I, if my books fall into that category for some people, I'd much rather give them the opportunity to get it. And right. um, but yeah, that's that's been a lot of the the highlights and you know usually what i'll do is i'll like look back through all my facebook posts at the end of the year and like recap that stuff but usually you know those are some of the ones that really stand out awesome thank you for sharing man and those are there's some great highlights uh while we're talking about books you recently shared on an episode of faith and fandom that you've started writing a book called flocked up uh yes. <laughs> which i'm loving the title um, so what was the inspiration behind this, man? Um, well, like, you know, I know most of my stuff that we, I talk about with people is faith and fandom, but you know, I've been in ministry full time for going on, um, what year is this? Uh, <laughs> for about 20 years and, um, I work full time as a pastor. And one of the things I see so often is that the church really still sucks. <laughs> um, in a lot of ways, like not that I don't love the church and that's the, literally the book isn't saying I, it's, I'm not saying I don't love the church. Um, but that we still really make mistakes. We still do a lot of things wrong as a church. The, the idea is that we are still very much living out what Isaiah said in Isaiah 53 of we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have gone into our own path. Um, that even though we have the great shepherd, even though that we have, you know, the spirit leading us and all these things, we still completely go our own way in the wrong way. And, um, so, and, you know, I had pitched, you know, this was an idea. This was like something in my notepad of like, 
let's do this sometime um, because usually that's when that stuff happens i'll be driving and get an idea and say something and like okay cool we should do this later but like we had a pastoral planning meeting where we were planning out our sermons or at least the direction we were heading for our sermons for um the next six months and you know i was like i jokingly say stuff sometimes thinking it's gonna get laughed off and we're gonna move on with our lives and um I threw out flock, you know, I was like, well, I am planning to write a book called flocked up, you know, about how we still go astray. And like my executive pastor's like, yep, let's do it. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I was like, well, I guess I have to write this book now. Um, <laughs> so, uh, it's, it's, it's not going to be like a long one. It's going to be a, a smaller one. I think it might be a little bigger than the 10 things student ministry book. Um, it might be a little bit bigger than that. Oh, it definitely will be bigger than that. Never mind. Um, but it's going to be six sections of areas that we fail, to, or that not that we fail at, that directions we're still going our own way in. Um, the area of equipping believers, mm. um, the balance of kingdom versus community, mm. because we as church focus so much on community that we ignore the kingdom aspects of what we're doing. Um, we that we go our own way and how we're supposed to love, uh, the unity, uh, peace, and uh, it's another one. Do, 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 do. I don't remember. <laughs> but <laughs> either way, there's there's six sections and four of them are completely written. Um, and I just outlined five and six yesterday, and my goal would be to send it to get printed. Um. By the end of this month. Nice. Um, if not sooner. Because um, my church is actually going to start doing it as a sermon series uh, in October. Okay. And so one of the benefits of that is, and it might not be me on each one, but all of our sermons are recorded in video and audio format. So, like, in essence, there will be a version of an, a complete audio book of this when it's done. Nice. Um, so that'll be that'll be a thing but it's just you know encouraging it's been one of those things of just talking to myself about we need to do better um and so i'm, I'm excited about it and um I, when it comes out i'm just gonna make it as cheap as amazon will let me and <laughs> just to get it out there and uh but yeah that's that's flocked up with just one of those things that you know it's a it's a term that's been in my head for a long time that whenever I see the sheep of God's flock acting foolish um, <laughs> that they're flocked up and um well and, and like we had talked about it yesterday in our sermon planning or the day before that uh it's really it's this mindset this this mass mindset of as long as I blend in and go along with the way the rest of the flock is going. I don't stand out and I can't be called out. So we just get right. comfortable in doing what everybody else is doing and uh, do that. That was actually, um, I think it was also my uh, fantasy football team name a couple years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so that's the idea with that. So that'll be, um, that'll be coming out this year. So that'll be another book on the the roster and then, Book seven is being outlined already for roughly outlined. I've got like four chapters, but I also am not paying attention to it right now. <laughs> so awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that, man. I'm really, really excited uh, for for the book. When I when I heard you mention in that episode, I'm like, oh, my goodness, I'm in like I'm out <laughs> if I see a pre order, I'm like done because uh, I loved the I love your faith and fandom stuff, but I also really, really loved the uh, 10 things I learned from sucking a student ministry book. Um, I really enjoy your writing style. Um, on a total side note, though, as you were saying how you pitched the pitched it to the staff and then they were like, I guess we're doing it. Uh, it reminded me of uh, way back when they did the, the death of Superman story in comics, the way the people who were writing it will say it because it was a documentary with Superman Doomsday is they were going to do the wedding they couldn't the lois and clark show was doing it so they're your they were like you can't do the wedding we're you gotta wait till we do it and then one of the writers just was like we could kill them and then everybody laughed and then they paused and they're like all right let's do it <laughs> like 
the worst one of me opening my stupid mouth um, was uh, our church. Uh, again, our church is very, very biblically based, and you know we're not crazy, but you know sometimes we'll go out on a limb for stupid things. And um, <laughs> we're doing a series on sex and marriage, and um, you know they're like, "What would be a good title for a sex series?" And you know. Uh, everybody was throwing around super lame ideas and um, so I was just being an idiot and I was like how about Fifty Shades of Grace <laughs> and <laughs> and, um, and again me and my big mouth and they went with it and, oh my um, gosh <laughs> so we had a six, se- a six weeks series called Fifty Shades of Grace and we had like <laughs> book covers in lar- like giant book covers in our lobby that had um like themes for each week that looked like Fifty Shades covers and I'm like crap I can't talk anymore <laughs> it's like don't let me speak um, because sometimes I say stuff and you actually let it happen um it's like you know I also wanted to do um and th- this one got shut down but I'm it might not be done yet um of doing a series at our church about, uh, biblical women leaders. Right. Um, like Esther, Ruth, Deborah, um, you know, Timothy's aunt or was it Timothy's aunt? Whatever the lady that raised Timothy. Um, but like doing a series on lessons we learned from biblical women leaders and calling it, that's what she said. (laughs) And, (laughs) and, um, so like I pitched that one time and like one of one of the our interns um who is like coming from a much much more hardcore traditional background was like no we can't and I'm like dude we did 50 shades of grace this is nothing <laughs> and um he's like well we ain't doing it now and so like one of our interns flipped out and so we didn't do it um but just maybe <laughs> that might be a thing. Um, that might be a thing. Oh, so. awesome. Uh, I, when you mentioned the Fifty Shades of Grace, the other thing I was like, alternative title? I never read the book, but I just love it because it's a very Piper title. Uh, his uh, Seductions from the Poems of John Piper, Velvet Steel. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> There you go. There you go. Uh, maybe, maybe that. Maybe that's going to be your breakthrough, right there. <laughs> you write that out. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right. So, second to last question is: uh, What are some of the upcoming movies and shows uh, that you're most excited for? Because they've been at D twenty at Comic Con and then D twenty three. We got so many new things rolled out. Um, we were talking about Hulk earlier. I'm surprised, excited, but surprised about a She-Hulk show because I thought the rights with Universal would not allow that with her being like a Hulk character. Um, but then also the one, I, like we're getting Moon Knight. I'm stoked because Moon Knight's awesome. Uh, yeah, Moon Knight is great. So yeah, um, what's some of the stuff out of the upcoming? <laughs> um. Real talk. I'm excited about going to see Downton Abbey tonight. Uh, <laughs> the right Downton on. Abbey movie premieres tonight, so I'm about that life. Um, <laughs> I don't know, man. Um, I have to pace myself because I get, you know... Well, here, here's the thing for me. I don't get excited until it's actually happening. Um, until I like, I know it's like literally about to be in my face. Um, right. I am looking forward to... And that's the thing. Like, I know I'm going to get Disney+. Plus. But I'm also like, man, that's more money and time, and uh, I don't, I don't even know what I'm most excited about or really excited about. Like, um, I'm, I'm interested to watch the Joker, obviously. Um, uh, I'm a little more apprehensive about Harley Quinn and the emancipation of whatever that is, Birds of Prey. Um, I'm excited to see you and McGregor play Black Mask. Yeah, that, that's a thing. Um, I'm really interested to, uh, see what the Spider-Verse people bring next. Mm-hmm. Um, 
just because I think that that's going to offer something solid. I I don't know. Um, I I know that the Mandalorian will be dope. Um, you know, I, that's the thing. It's just like looking at a sea of possibilities and trying to figure out like which wave do I want to hit me. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So uh, yeah, I don't know, but I mean, I'm I'm excited about all the things. That that's me, and in, in a nutshell, I'm excited about all the things. So I'm I'm here for the party <laughs> and, with my notepad ready. <laughs> <laughs> it's you got you got chapters coming up, man. You, yeah, I do. The, I do. With all the stuff coming, you might have book eight and nine out of out of this sea of this bevy of riches that's upon us. I've I've real I've always discussed like. Uh, skipping ahead, <laughs> like it just throwing, like jumping a couple numbers, and the uh, like. So, like, if instead of doing book seven, do book ten. <laughs> <laughs> just pull and, a naked gun. <laughs> yeah, just pull a naked gun, and then like a couple years later, drop book seven. Like <laughs> it came from the fast or something. <laughs> uh, you you could totally do that. You could do it somehow, like Doctor Who themed. Oh, I know. I totally. I, it's it's been it's been an idea. <laughs> I, I do think there is wisdom le- uh, in uh, waiting until stuff is actually coming. Um, I I like DC, but the, I'm frustrated with their with their movies just because they'll announce so much and then it's just like I'm rocking my Nightwing shirt right now. Like two years ago, they announced Nightwing. Nothing since. No word. No development. I'm like is. Is this thing dead in the water? Same thing with uh, Batgirl. They're like, Joss Whedon's going to write and direct. All right, we're going to get a female director. Nothing since. No development. Oh, no. Nothing. That's all gone. But but Nightwing <laughs> making an appearance in Titans hasn't been, is going to be good. Right. Yeah. No, it's just... I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm somewhat with you where it's like, <laughs> announce it when it's happening. Otherwise, it's just, you're teasing. Don't tease me. Just, just tell yeah. me it's here. Um, all right. So final question, my good man, how can we pray for you? (sighs) Um, faithfulness, just the, that I would be faithful in everything I'm doing and in my walk, um, just with my family, because my family's growing and changing and dynamic. Um, I've got little girls that are becoming little women and learning to deal with that, um, I've had uh, several first kiss conversations with my daughter in the car lately of like, you know, you like, when is this okay for you? How do you feel about this? Like, uh, if someone tries to touch you on, when you don't want it, stab them in the thigh and twist. <laughs> um, like, I mean, I'm having those conversations. Um, I'm also tired, just like realistically, like um, seven years straight of doing this stuff is a hustle. And, um, the constant travel, the financial obligation is, you know, I like one thing I stopped carrying book one yeah, in, in physical format with me to shows. Um, and I just had to tell people, I was like, look, I can't afford to print nine books every time I walk out the door. Um, so I was like, you're going to get six (laughs) and you can, (laughs) the restaurant Amazon, God bless you and your family. Um, (laughs) Uh, and so like realistically when book seven comes out, I'll probably drop book two from shows and like, but I, that's the thing. Like I really love book two. And so I don't know. Um, but overall it's just, I I think faithfulness really covers it. Um, just if you pray for my faithfulness because, um, uh, it's like Luke sixteen ten. If you can be faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in the big things. If you're not faithful in little things, you can't be trusted with the big things. And mm. uh, like realistically, I need to be I need to be steady on faithful with the little things so that I can actually be ready and in the right place when the big things show up. Absolutely, uh, that's some great insight, and we can. Uh, I'll definitely be keeping you in prayer. And uh, dear listener, please keep uh, Hector in prayer. Um, as you've just heard his heart, uh, it is, it, it's awesome that you're doing all this, but it can definitely be insanely taxing. So we'll, we'll definitely be keeping you in prayer, my good sir. Thank you. No problem. All right. Well, 
Uh, dear listener, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of One Cross Radio. Uh, please be sure to keep an eye out for the upcoming Flocked Up. Seriously, can't wait for that. Um, <laughs> you can find uh, Hector with Faith and Fandom on Facebook, on Instagram. You're on most of the things. <laughs> I'm on most of the things. My Twitter is half-baked, you know, but whatever. Um, <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Uh, Well, Hector, thank you for joining us today. And uh, dear listener, hope you enjoyed. Have a wonderful day and God bless, my friends. Take care. Peace.